right, so we have Massimiliano and Avinash, if I pronounce it I just go by Massi. Don't, uh, yeah. I think it's coming up. Yeah. 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 All right, so, uh, okay, the next, next talk, let's see. Next talk, we'll talk about the Metabob, uh, an AI assistive tool for uh, debugging uh, Python code. So, uh, take, take, take it from here, the floor is yours. All right. Uh, would you like me to like? I mean, I, we want to keep it as just informal and uh, Q and A based as possible. We don't want to make it too commercial. If you guys want, I can give a very quick introduction, like a five minutes PowerPoint. We yeah, don't want to, and then we'll uh, we'll keep the rest as just informal discussion. Yeah. Um, all right. Can you guys see my screen? Uh, we see it now. Yes. Also, all right. So, a tiny bit about us. Um, Metabob started as a project about two years ago. Uh, we started. Uh, um, both Avi and I were pretty active open source contributors. Um, we started working with NSC Lab, which is a Japanese company at Princeton, linking a AI lab with the goal of really finding a method that could help uh, um, automate debugging and the code review process. We are located in Silicon Valley, Mountain View. Uh, we have right now about 10, 12 members, again, mainly heavily engineering. Um, as mentioned, we are initially we were part of NEC Lab. We then spin out and we're now fully independent. We also went through a few accelerator. Alchemist is uh, one of them, which is a, a San Francisco based accelerator. And we're also currently part of the NetApp Accelerator, which is like a program targeting deep, deep tech companies uh, all across the globe. And uh, we're doing like a, pro a project with them. A tiny bit also about myself, as mentioned, I've been like a entrepreneur, an entrepreneur my entire life. I'm originally from Italy. You guys probably can get it from the accent. I moved uh, in the United States in Silicon Valley about 10 years ago. Um, since then, always started a project mainly in the AI space. Um, I also, along with Avi, we started a project uh, uh, focusing on the open source community called Clice, where we created a framework for governance uh, that could help open source project to be run more efficiently and also help uh, contributors to monetize from their contributions. Um, Avi, you want to tell a tiny bit about yourself? Uh, yeah, so my background is mainly in engineering research. Uh, so before uh, working with Mossy, I spent a lot of time working more in the aerospace sector. Uh, so I was doing like airfoil design, safety, and a lot of the methods that you would use for that, the numerical methods in order to make approximations, carry over fairly well into uh, the more machine learning space because they do use similar processes and flows and like a similar conception in how uh, they operate. So basically, since you're just uh, trying to identify a, uh, a pattern based off of uh, the uh, data surrounding the pattern, uh, you can just do it in reverse. So it, it landed itself fairly well to working more in uh, the AI tech space. Uh, from there, I also did a lot of research uh, into generating different sorts of uh, tracking and area mapping systems uh, for very, various types of semi autonomous vehicles. And then after that, uh, we started working on a project together after joining Hackathon. Uh, and basically that was for helping open source developers uh, better understand how their contributions are affecting uh, the overall end product and how they should be, uh, in many cases, compensated for that. All right. Yeah, so I'll tell you a bit about what we are trying to achieve. Uh, obviously, we all know debugging is an extremely time-consuming and tedious process affecting uh, mental health uh, quite a lot. Um, so, and currently what most people do, like we use a rule-based static analysis tool, linters and so on. The, though the main issue with that is like they heavily rely on the individual developer's ability to define problem through simple rules. And really, that's why we created uh, Metabob to we build a semantic understanding model on top of a static analysis tool to enable developers to identify the cause behind what we call logic-based or complex-based bugs. Um, and again, to do that, we build a, a semantic understanding model mainly based out of high-quality open-source repos, along with some Reddit and Stack Overflow, 
uh, company SOPs, company design standard program analysis, as well as manual review historical results. And a combination of all these data sets enables our AI agents to learn the best programming practices and to generate ready to use code snippets to automate the process, improving uh, the developer's productivity. Uh, the, the method currently we have around a 72, 74% accuracy with right below 5% false positive rates. And obviously, like the, the model improves uh, through user interaction with the platform. Now, really, what makes us unique right now is the type of bugs we're able to detect. Again, current solution mainly rely um, that, like, as a rule based static analysis tool, are only able to detect problems local to line of code, such as syntax, fixing style, typos, and so on. While well, on our end, because of uh, how the, the model was trained, we're explicitly learning, able to learn. Uh, out of rule function and uh, to detect uh, logic based bugs such as all type of performance issue due to user modules or race condition, um, problem arising for multi threading or process sharing. Um, I will actually let Tavi do that this part, but overall, uh, the bugs that we right now we are quite strong at identifying and detecting are all related to NumPy, Pandas, and SkyKit type of type, type errors. We currently mainly focus on. ML developers, uh, data scientists, as due to our data sets, those are definitely the type of issues that our model is uh, the strongest to identify. Um, yeah, and uh, uh, oh. wait a second. Sorry about that. Oh. All right. So uh, with yeah. that out of the way. Uh, okay. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, Sorry about that. I mean, yeah, you can go ahead. Uh, we can go over a, a quick product demo, and as we show you how the product looks like, we can uh, again feel free to ask us questions as we talk. Uh, again, we want to keep it as informal as possible. This is not like we're not trying to sell anything, just to get your feedback. So. Um, yeah, if you already have a question, just go ahead. And in the meantime, Abby, maybe you can show the product and go over and tell a bit more how we came up with it. Yeah, sounds good. So uh, while I go and do that, uh, basically what we can do also is, uh, depending on how you guys want to proceed, uh, I can talk more about the product and like how we can help uh, you guys find different solutions for your pro projects. Or alternatively, we can talk a bit more about AI and ML in general, and also programming in general, and basically uh, get a bit more information about the space. And I can speak to the challenges that we face while trying to build the product and the types of issues that we encounter. So whichever one you think will be more interesting for you guys. Yeah, it's uh, like how, yeah, it's, it'll be interesting how you, how you went about it, like how you start such a thing. Like it seems like yeah, pretty complicated. Like uh, you literally like have to have code that looks for code, right? How how would you even start <laughs> such a thing? Yeah, uh, that's definitely it's. Still an ongoing process, actually, but uh, <laughs> definitely something that is very, uh, like, it's a very noisy domain, I'm going to have to say. Uh, probably one of the noisiest domains that you could probably encounter, simply because there's many different ways of achieving the same result. Uh, and while under the hood, things may end up being fairly similar in how programs are structured, uh, the way the patterns are constructed on like the, the developer side can vary quite a lot. And then also, the problems themselves are very context-based. So they're not things that are directly related to a specific area or specific type of uh, like issue that you can just say, oh, yeah, it's here every time. There's already tools like that that do linting or static analysis in that sort of sense. So you have your pilot or your flight gate or the rest that can find like big uh, very obvious patterns that are not necessarily bugs per se, but you could obviously make it uh, find certain types of bugs, but are more just sorts of areas where uh, it's not necessarily best practices to do a certain sort of program in a certain sort of way. And that's kind of what the existing solutions are uh, to find different sorts of bugs within uh, or different sorts of problems within your source code. Uh, but basically, what we would need to do in order to create an AI that would be able to do this is to be able to implicitly learn exactly what code changes are and what code changes need to be made in order to make adjustments uh, to the code base in order to help resolve these types of issues. 
So speaking to that, uh, as Masi had mentioned earlier, basically what we uh, did was collect a lot of data from open source repositories. So that includes places uh, like GitHub, Bitbucket, and GitLab, along with uh, Stack Overflow, as he mentioned earlier. And what we were doing with that data was not actually looking directly for the code changes themselves. In fact, what we started out doing was looking at the documentation surrounding the code changes. So I don't know how much experience uh, most people here have with Git in general, but there's uh, merge and pull requests that are frequently made open source projects, as well as uh, different commits as part of the commit history, as well as the comments for both of these. And for the more well-maintained projects, which are really where we want to do most of our learning from, because they are most likely to have uh, either a stable set of standards they want to achieve or a stable set of performance uh, like guidelines they want to meet. So uh, for these larger sorts of open source projects, there's a very uh, robust uh, tracking of what changes are made and why they're being made. And what we're doing uh, at the front end was basically just uh, was going through this data set and then trying to learn why are people making code changes? Uh, what are the underlying reasons? And we actually use a uh, machine learning methodology or a machine learning technique called LDA for latent gear clear allocation to do a two-stage topic modeling on this. Uh, so for the first stage, what we were doing was we were going through all of the data uh, coming in. So uh, straight from the source, we did some basic tokenization to remove some of the more uh, specific named entities like usernames and the like, and then keep things that are common across multiple different Python projects. And then from there, basically what we did was uh, we took that information and we tried to determine whether or not a certain uh, comment was referring to a change that was due to a new feature or uh, a documentation change or like a version update. So let's say like NumPy went from version 0.1 to 0.2, you now need to update your package has a new one. So we tried to remove all those from the data set by identifying which changes were related to those without having to look at the code itself. Because they usually bundle multiple changes together. So if there's like a version change, they might also change the version in a couple of different config files in different locations. And we didn't want to flag those, right? So without having to look at any of the source code, we were trying to identify why a change was made. Uh, so if we could filter out all of the noise that we wouldn't want to listen to because we were trying to figure out exactly why certain bug fixes were made, we would need to remove all the new features, all of the documentation, and all of the, uh, the other version updates, and keep the things that are security improvements, uh, security fixes, uh, performance improvements, and, and bug fixes. Uh, and then with that remaining data set, we then need to filter it out again into a subset of categories based off of why the code change was made. So we're trying to identify basically uh, from the surrounding documentation, is there some underlying similarity between uh, different categories of bugs? Or can you classify bugs into broad categories? Uh, for the most part, we were able to do that. It's definitely stronger in some areas than in other areas. In fact, I actually think what we're doing right now that is less than ideal is that we are over-classifying uh, bugs into very specific groupings, and we're uh, neglecting some of the more broader similarities that could extend themselves to multiple different types of bug categories at the same time, but it just happened to express itself as one type of issue uh, in this particular instance due to the contextual content, due to the contextual factors surrounding the usage of the code. So basically what we're actually doing right now is accounting for that uh, using a, uh, a method uh, that will allow us to do like a semi-supervised uh, training method and also have additional people to help us out and do like semi-labeled, like partially computer-labeled, partially human-labeled uh, data sets that we can then feed in. So basically what we're doing there is we're now more uh, accurately specifying which categories uh, a bug would fall into. And that's that's just the data cleanup part of it. So, uh, <laughs> so do, do you have maybe like a like like an example? Like for example, 
like like a real example like okay i have this piece of code and then uh applying your methods it's gonna tell you like how to fix it or what the problem is they have something you can show like something that's gonna like a concrete concrete example that yeah for me pop it open i uh i started the demo but then i i didn't share the screen so uh basically uh so what we do is uh, we interface with your SCM provider. So we are currently in the CI/CD stage of development, or rather, where we'll be placed inside of your development pipeline. We're we're near the end of the process. So it's after you commit your code to uh, your your provider, or like after you commit it to GitHub, uh, then we'll automatically run an analysis on it, and then be able to identify certain types of problems according to our detection criteria. Uh, and you'll be able to view them either from uh, within GitHub. What we do is we uh, send you a, a report uh, if you request one, and it will provide the list of uh, particular bugs. This is done automatically if you configure it. Uh, but uh, for the most part, you'll just be redirected back here into our UI, where we'll show you basically a list of issues that we've detected on this left-hand side along with uh, where they're located within your code base. So for example, you can click through any one of these and just uh, find uh, a particular type of problem. So in this case, uh, they are using a, in this particular library, uh, it's actually like a big data uh, uh, lookup table, essentially. And what they do for this, uh, this library is that they use a special class to generate hashes and like store special hashes that they're using to look up other information based off of what those hash values are. And it's a fuzzy matter, so it can do it in log log time. Uh, and that's why it's called, uh, and that's why it's set up here like that. So uh, basically for this operation, uh, they are reading in, uh, in a different location in the code base. They're reading in that uh, this data from external files or from uh, public a API, essentially, that they can like, load things in from. Uh, but in this entire flow, they, they never explicitly make sure that what data they're adjusting is properly of the same type uh, as what was generated. And what we would should you do... Mind, would you mind increasing your font size? It's just hard to see. Please. Uh, this better. Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. Uh, so uh, basically, uh, what we what we can do with our actual bug detection model, which uh, I can get into explaining a bit more now, uh, is that we take in the raw source code itself, and we actually use a, uh, a technique called graph attention. Uh, our model is a graph attention based classifier, uh, and it's something that's very new. But essentially, it takes in a graph as an input matrix, essentially, uh, which is which contains all of the uh, the edges between varying components, along with a semantic vector for each uh, component itself. And what we do is we we parse our code base into its abstract syntax tree, which is just how the code is structured and uh, how the interpreter, the Python interpreter, views source code. Uh, it sees it as like a a, a a directed graph of different. Uh, functions and different components that call other components, as well as have other components inside of them. So like a function will have a list of parameters, and then in each one of those parameters, they're going to be names. And these names refer to particular things that are then that would be needed to be loaded from memory uh, under a, their certain key. So your, your interpreter like has the ability to uh, parse the code base into the structure and then execute it. So we use the same uh, basic structure as like a base, but we actually add on quite a bit more additional information. So we add on both semantic factors that come from the context of how something is being used and also how what it's called and where in other locations it's called the same thing. Uh, so we're looking for different words and different specific types of uh, features within uh, each set of, uh, of abstract syntax tree components to group together into a single semantic vector. And then we also take into account the code flow, uh, which is essentially 
how the program is uh, going to be running together after being executed. So we take we can keep track of things like loops and things uh, that would load things dynamically from memory later. Uh, so we can store all this uh, context information, essentially, about how the program will be operating, and we pass in that as an input vector into our into our model. Uh, so what we're actually doing is we're identifying different regions within the code base that have certain structures that have been changed and know that they've been changed because of the commit history. We know which regions of the code can change. And we also know why they were changed because we did the two-stage LDA topic modeling system. And we're basically predicting these are the regions of the code that are, will be changed in your code base, and here are the reasons why. And then we produce an explanation for for each one of these. And right now, uh, we are trying out using GPT-3 for that. But we, we currently use uh, a modified version of GPT-2 for the uh, publicly available version of our model. So that's basically the whole AI pipeline. Uh, so what we do for each uh, bug detection that we want to find, we, we can look at different places within the code base. So it's not just related to this particular structure, uh, because we're having a very a much more well-connected view of how the code base is fitting together with other components and other modules. Uh, what we can do essentially is uh, learn which ones of these modules are most relevant to a particular type of issue, or uh, which ones of these components within your own code base are most relevant to a particular type of issue, or even to identify if they are relevant to being a particular type of issue. And using that, we can learn dynamically from how the edges are constructed, which, uh, which areas of the code base have uh, a higher propensity to need to be changed. And we can do this with a very uh, well, a much better degree of signal to noise uh, than uh, other methods uh, that don't have an attention-based system to boost it. So I'm going to ask a kind of a, a, like a more crazy question. So as, as your system learns more about the code, would you see the, a future when your code is going to write code? Uh, yeah, so as you can see right here, we actually do generate little code snippets that can be inserted for certain types of problems. Uh, our end goal essentially here for our application uh, is to become a meta programming tool. Uh, so basically what we want to do is be able to take in requirements and then produce viable code that can fulfill those requirements. Uh, there's already other tools and other ways in the space of doing that. Uh, even for GPT-3, as I'm sure many of you may be aware, when it was announced last year, uh, basically there were a lot of different things on, on Twitter and other places of people using it to generate different React components and different JavaScript uh, components for like web frontends. So you would ask GPT-3 to say, oh, make a button and then have it be read and centered in the page and have it say hello and then it would it would make something that does that uh to, to it's plus or minus on how accurate it was to to get things exactly how you want it to be and it took a couple of tries and it wasn't like necessarily easy to use but it was capable of doing it in some instances and the issue with that method and also the newer methods that they're doing to generate code directly from requirements to solve certain types of problems. So they'll be like, here's like a programming course question, uh, and then have an AI generate the solution to that question. Is that for all of these methods, what they're doing is essentially they are uh, just creating entirely new bespoke snippets of code that just do that one thing. But they don't play nicely with the rest of the code base. So while it might be good to generate like a one off thing for a script, or like it might be fun to generate a button. Uh, they don't take into account the fact that code bases are very, like, they grow to be very large and expensive things with a lot of internal dependencies. And they're not going to leverage those dependencies because they aren't aware that they exist uh, in the same capacity. So what, our, what a graph attention type model allows us to do is basically to go through and embed that information uh, within the code base uh, or within the, uh, the inputs. 
and then use that to basically produce a transformation uh, from one graph structure to another about how to hook up additional edges to generate new code and also have it use a function that you may have defined in a different module as a, one of the uh, parameters or one of the things to call uh, in order to get some information back. Because it knows that when you call that function, it will go through its own program flow and then return a certain type of information as that matches basically what would need to be generated. It's better to use that than to generate a new thing. Right, uh, simply because it would still need to be maintained by human beings at some point. So, uh, what we can do uh, with our technique is basically uh, enable us. It, it enables us to being able to add in that information and then also use that information to insert other pieces of code from your own code base inside of a function that we generate. And that's uh, what we're currently working on, actually. So it is something that's in the future. Right now, we also use GPT-3 to generate these uh, these code snippets. And they do work all right. But uh, again, it is more of a uh, more of an experimental feature. Yeah. Are there any questions in the chat? I can see the chat. But, uh... Yeah. So we had a question from um, Patrick Schultz here. Uh, and he says, if I recall correctly, your model learns from some, quote, exemplary code repos. Um, could you give us some examples of what those are and how did you pick them? Yeah, so uh, basically we are, we actually take in all code repositories. We actually just weight them based off of how many contributors there are, how many forks there are for a particular project and how active the project is in terms of like having pull requests and using a good structure for implementing or integrating these pull requests into either a master branch or a regular release pattern. So these are the things that we're kind of looking for in terms of uh, like metrics that we that we rate against. So things that typically rank highly are things from the Python Software Foundation uh, for obvious reasons. So like the request library, uh, NumPy. Uh, though most of NumPy is in C, uh, we do keep track of some of the, uh, the higher level API stuff that they have written in there. Uh, and then also uh, other like more well-used libraries uh, like Sphinx as well. And uh, just, just a couple off the top of my head. But uh, basically that's how we do the ranking. And then for things that don't match that as highly, we still train off the data, it's just that because of how our data set is built, uh, we are naturally predisposed to oversample from some of the larger repositories for two reasons. One, because they are better uh, repositories on average with more activity, but that also means they have more code changes, which also means they have more bug fixes or more performance improvements and more changes that are relevant to our uh, use case. And because we don't want to have our model trained too specifically for a particular type of project. So uh, we need to actually also include and potentially even like over sample some of the, uh, the bugs that occur in projects that aren't necessarily the exemplary ones. But we try and keep a, a ratio so that in the outcome of the training data set that we have uh, the more uh, well-maintained repositories have uh, greater uh, like share of uh, the training data sets and the less well maintained ones have the less uh, greater share, but we also sometimes uh, have to oversample them so that they are still represented enough within the code base so that we don't grow to fit too closely to a particular uh, code base to identify a particular sort of problem, uh, because that's always a risk uh, with this type of methodology. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks, uh, thanks for your answer. Um, we have a question from Chris Morrow here in the chat, um, and he'd like to know if there are particular categories of bugs uh, that Metabob is like especially good at finding. Uh, yeah, so as uh, Masi showed for a very short section, but uh, I'll show again uh, for a much longer period of time. Uh, basically, we are much better at detecting sort of these sorts of problems. 
Uh, in particular, uh, what we can detect uh, more cleanly are issues that are related to like NumPy and other data science libraries like Scikit, uh, simply because, again, there's a lot of them in the data set. Uh, a lot of people who are doing Python are doing it in the data science machine learning space, and they use things like NumPy and Scikit and Pandas. And then on top of that, there's frequently a lot of issues that arise from not doing this in the quote unquote proper way. Uh, so there's a lot of performance improvements you can do in NumPy that better take advantage of how it's built internally uh, that aren't readily apparent to somebody who may just be getting into Python and is used to using the Python list or isn't used to using the Python list and assumes NumPy also works in the same way. Uh, even though there are like very different ways to handle both of these things to ha maximize performance from each of them. Uh, so that's mainly what we can find. Uh, and then in growing layers of uh, less confidence, we also have other issues that are related to like uh, race conditions and multi-threading and multi-processing and sharing data between different processes that are launched from the same program as well as other issues are arising from like web service frameworks. And these are just very, uh, I guess you could say, uh, endemic problems to the programming space, especially uh, for newer developers. So it, it meshes fairly well in terms of what we can detect right now. But, but really what we want to do is sort of extend it out to have support for more general programming issues as well. And that's uh, what we're trying to, to do right now. Thank you so much for that answer. Um, if you don't mind, I'd like to follow up the question about um, NumPy errors specifically. So I know there is a big push right now to get support into MyPy, uh, the optional static typer for Python, um, to be able to annotate NumPy arrays with at least their dimensionality, um, possibly also their shape. Um, is Metabob something that, you know, out of the box right now can detect shape mismatches between array operations? Uh, yeah, actually, for some uh, some shape operations or some shape mismatches, we can we can identify issues that arise uh, from not uh, ensuring that the shapes are properly correlated. Uh, simply because usually what you do in order to fix this is add in additional pieces of code to basically either uh, coerce the shape into the proper form or uh, make adjustments to what the, the underlying shape is. So because we have samples like that in our data set, uh, we can identify that if you are doing these operations in a way that is uh, unsafe, or at least in a way that won't be guaranteed to work all the time because you aren't ensuring that the shapes are properly uh, coordinated, then uh, we can flag, we, we already flag some of those as potential issues, and we have the issue explanation be related to the shapes. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, as always, uh, if you'd like to ask a question, please feel free to, to unmute yourself and speak up. Um, if you're feeling a little bit shy and you'd rather have me ask the question, of course, uh, you can continue typing these in the chat. Um, I'd like to follow up with that one, too. Um, so in the work that I do, um, a lot of the bugs that we encounter have to do with data validation problems. So we get some you know, uh, data type or particular values that we aren't expecting. And you know, after six hours of work, we find out that there's a divide by zero happening somewhere because uh, we weren't expecting any zeros to show up. Uh, is this something that MetaBob currently can, can see? Uh, yeah, so uh, they're mostly, uh, I guess you could say, clustered around issues with web frameworks, but we do identify problems like that where you are reading in different uh, user, di different user data from one of the API, but not uh, necessarily going through the process to uh, validate that it is exactly what you should be expecting later and then accessing these items without properly going through that process. Uh, it's simply because we also see a lot of people move towards a more model or like a data structure based approach to that, uh, using like a data class or something to coerce things into and then uh, after marshalling it into one of these objects, you would then pass it around to the rest of your components just to ensure that everything is meeting up in the proper uh, format. And because there's examples of that in the open source data set, we can find problems like that that would require that kind of change. Awesome.
awesome. Thank you so much. I'd love to know a little more about the feature of writing the code because one of the big challenges of um, true multi-processing, not just multi-threading, uh, is things like data races, and you can even get into hardware level issues if your machine is big enough. Um, if you're getting into like supercomputing stuff like that, but um, it would be really nice if this could even lead to some kind of easily scalable, I guess, multi-processing library. Um, because if this thing finds that there are hot spots of errors, that could guide the development of even just hand-coded, human-developed um, software to address those problems, to be a sort of uh, patch of patches, if you will. Yeah, uh, I definitely get what you're getting at. So basically, even if we just provide like a heat map of like, here's inside of the multiprocessing library, when it's being used, these are the, the, the API endpoints essentially that are going to be causing the most issues down the line, simply because they are frequently needing to be changed all the time because they keep causing problems, especially at scale. And then like a human being who's like working on that library can uh, do additional uh, like take additional care to make sure that those are, are safer or at least more performant for those use cases, right? Oh no, I have something else in mind. I mean to allow human beings to take less or even no care about the details of the implementation, just like how we don't worry about what the assembler or compiler is doing when you write a C program. Ah, uh, yeah. So again, as mentioned, that's basically what our sort of end goal is. To basically, uh, what we kind of want to do is allow developers to focus more on the broader architectural goals of whatever they're developing. So as opposed to dealing with, uh, I guess you could say, uh, it's a step above boilerplate, but it's the rope code that you would write in order to do certain sorts of operations, like, for example, getting jobs to run a, a multiprocessing system. Uh, you would need to make the same sort of like structure, or the same sort of architecture, and then put things into there that are application specific. But what we want to be able to do is say, hey, uh, just make this multiprocessing structure. I need to have like a number of workers as a function of how many processes are available on the host machine. Also, can you run this function a couple times? And, and it would just be able to do that directly and just fill in all the gaps and then also use the appropriate methodology to, uh, to both spawn the processes, manage them, uh, handle the data passing and doing all of that. So yeah, I think uh, we are in agreement on what we want to be able to do. Obviously that's kind of far off from where we are. So we're going to focus right now on like trying to fix the small problems and then work our way up. I don't think that you're um, you're really that far off from it because there is such a library already. It's called Dask, and it has a really nice object-oriented, uh, lazy evaluation where you do just that. It even uh, has a diagram printer. It's great. Um, I think the the real question is, um, could you look at a piece of Dask code and say, have I done something that isn't obvious? Um, that uh, that is going to lead to some sort of kerfuffle. And the other question is, you know, when you're looking at more than just a patch of code, when you're looking at, like, systems of, you know, this pi file, this pi file, this pi file, you know, larger assemblies can go wrong uh, because maybe there's a blocking issue somewhere or something like that. And so um, that's something that I'm... A, a little more interested in because I think that with a, a bit of practice, you can learn how to write good code, and you can use things like Dask to make sure that it's that it does just work. But you know, that's sort of only the beginning of the uh, of the problem. Yeah, uh, it's definitely a very exciting space to be in. That's kind of why we wanted to take on this project. Uh, and we feel that right now also, uh, there's a lot of new research in this space, especially on both the AI side as well as the uh, 
the non, the more analytical side to determine uh, the best way to both, uh, I guess you could say, discretize the problem and make it so it's very explicit uh, what, how things are going to be structured and also where problems are occurring. And with all this new data and all of these new techniques, uh, there's definitely a lot of room to grow and really make something that is uh, phenomenally uh, useful. So what would be your improvement onto DAST? Uh, our improvement onto that particular operation would be uh, basically what we would what we would want to do is uh, is I'm not too familiar with that, so I can't give you any specific examples about what our improvement would be. From what I understand from your description of it right now, uh, basically it is a way to do uh, essentially lazy operations on. Uh, on a like rough graph structure of what the code base would look like, uh, but basically what we would be doing is not specifically the analytics uh, part of it, but more so we would be building out each uh, each component itself. Uh, yeah, that, that's directly. what that is. Yeah, it, it builds that for you. You create an object that's lazily evaluated. So you say, okay, I want you to do this and that and the other thing, you tell it how many workers you want. And then once the whole thing is built and you do it all in native Python code, once the whole thing is built, then you just hit run and it just works. Oh, okay, yeah. So uh, basically our improvement on desk is to not not be an improvement on desk. Uh, we want to be able to do this for any, not just uh, particular types of uh, Python like data science libraries. Like our end goal is not to just only have the ability to like automatically track for like NumPy arrays or doing anything uh, specifically. Uh, we want to be able to just generally be able to create code for any arbitrary operation. Uh, obviously, that's a very much larger goal. So right now, we just want to fix particular issues, not with uh, scaling necessarily in NumPy or scaling necessarily in, in clusters, but also finding other sorts of issues in data validation or data cleanup or part of the ETL pipeline, doing different sorts of data uh, manipulations there. We can find and fix those issues as well. So uh, if Dask works very well for scaling up on, the, uh, on this side, then maybe what we'd be doing in terms of improving on Dask is getting more projects to put Dask as a requirement for their project by giving suggestions that say, oh, don't use a NumPy array here directly. Get Dask and use this Dask array uh, because it's just going to be more scalable for your use case. And that's the explanation and the suggestion that we provide. Not, not necessarily to rewrite it in NumPy. Like, we're going to pick whatever is the most effective solution to the problem. Or at least the goal is to always pick the most effective solution to the problem. I got you. So, yeah, all, uh, all I was going to say to that was I think you should definitely be looking for really thorny problems that have to be done a lot and really grueling. Um, might I also suggest JavaScript? Uh, we're actually looking into JavaScript. Uh, right now, on the like secret development side, uh, we're working on a Java version for some of our other uh, customers that we're speaking to, simply because they do have quite a lot of Java code. Uh, and in addition to that, the second highest rated or second high highest requested code uh, language support would be JavaScript. So we're, we're also going to be working on JavaScript later this year and further down the line. But it is definitely something we're, we're interested in supporting as well. Yeah, if you can fix ye olde Java, you know, freaking thornbush and uh, plumb the depths of madness that is JavaScript, I highly recommend <laughs> watching WAT, W-A-T, all lowercase. Um, I, I think you will have made a lot of people a lot less dependent on various substances, some of which are not even legal. <laughs> yeah, uh, hopefully we can improve public health. Uh, maybe we can get a substance for that too. Yeah, I, I do have a question. So have you thought like uh, 
So, like, I, I know you said, like, the way it is used right now is practically at, uh, it sits at the end of some, uh, like, CI CD pipeline, right? So, have you thought of maybe having some kind of, a, like, IDE plugin or something that is more immediate, like, uh, where you, like, it's practically as part of your programming, uh, like, flow? Like, you you change something and then the, maybe a plugin is going to tell you, hey, you, you, you've done something wrong, maybe even before, if that's not possible, maybe uh, like let's say when you you do your commit, commit locally, then it's gonna go and say, hey, uh, by the way, you, well maybe not you know it has to be maybe I'm thinking something like more immediate, like something like more immediate. Yeah. So like so IDE like, integration. So something, something more like, yeah. like kite or like a linter that you would normally use, like pylint or something. So as soon as you type something. Uh, or as soon as you finish like defining a function, uh, it'll go through and say, "Hey, whoa, whoa, whoa! You need yeah. to you need to fix this." You, yeah, you yeah. Made, uh, Before you already committed, already like. Yeah. <laughs> you already embarrassed yourself that you. <laughs> yeah. Well, we don't solve embarrassment right now. It is something <laughs> that uh, that we will want to help developers avoid in the future uh, by putting it early in the development. Pipeline, so basically yeah. closer to the ID. Uh, the we have some issues with that, uh, mainly because of how we're doing the inferencing. Uh, we yeah. need to go through and like have code. The way our model works, and what makes it unique, is that it can see a broad view of your code base and how it's connected, and use that yeah. to produce uh, the inferences. But if you're doing local programming, you would need to like upload most or all of that over, and we need to keep track of all these states. And it's more of a security issue that we want to avoid. Uh, Kite actually ran into like a big issue with this a couple years back about like uploading people's code to their servers to do machine learning on it. And uh, so maybe, we'd rather maybe can, avoid. Yeah, maybe you can encrypt uh, your models and then uh, get, make them part of the, of the IDE if they're not too big. I don't know, maybe that's another way. Like, yeah. Uh, I think it's kind of more like federated, I think it's called a federated learning, that from what I heard, where you, instead of bringing the, uh, like, practically, you, you bring the model to the data in some way. Exactly, so yeah. Case, so, yeah. So one of the other ways that we could do this is to like have the model run locally. It's just kind of, it's still, it's too big right now. So we need to, uh, our goal essentially is to refine the main Metabob model to a much higher degree than it is now. And when, when we plateau or get to a very good spot there, we'll probably see if we can make a Metabob Junior that can run uh, locally uh, and then have that be something that's running on your ID uh, that can keep you up to date and like find the, the more bigger issues. And then afterwards, you can still use the more robust version of Metabob later in the CICD pipeline in order to get the more intricate issues. That yeah, you can, you can probably use some kind of like uh, compressing methods like uh, student, I think the teachers to the models, like when you, you know, when you practically reduce some of the uh, Model connections, but you can still get almost the same accuracy. It might be, might have maybe like by a few points, a few, uh, you know, by a few numbers lower of accuracy, but uh, you might still be able to maybe sh compress it by using some of the student. I think it's called the uh, uh, teacher student model, where you use a teacher and then you have a student that's actually lighter, and then the student actually learns. Uh, learns practically what the teacher knows, but it uh, ends up being a smaller model and you might be able to bring it locally. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's that's kind of where the more ideal way of doing it than to upload anything. Uh, again, for the security reasons, we, we yeah. take it very seriously. We actually try not to store any user data for any amount of time longer than is absolutely required. Yeah, uh, I mean, that's like if you bring the model locally, and it's, uh, you encrypt it. There's there's ways to encrypt the models. Uh, you can you can you avoid the that problem where you don't send any data down down the, the stream. But if it's let's say if it's part of the IDE and if it's doesn't if it's not that big, <laughs> that's the other problem. <laughs> if it's not that big, then you can practically uh, avoid the the whole 
issue of sending data down down the, the pipe where they have some security issues. But, yeah, uh, but there's definitely the there's definitely methods to do it, and it's yeah. uh, it's pretty exciting actually uh, in terms of what, what could be possible. Yeah. Any more questions on the chat or? Uh, so I, I have kind of a, a weird question, and I was waiting for a segue to ask it. But yeah, you did mention Kite, and so Kite is a uh, an AI code generation tool. Have you tried running Metabob against uh, a code base that was heavily generated by Kite? That is a great suggestion. I'm going to try it uh, probably over this weekend, but we have not done that. No, uh, I'd love to see what the results would be, actually. That sounds very interesting. Yeah, I, I was the weird kid that would pit uh, chess AIs against one another, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's definitely a good idea. I'll, 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 I'll run it as soon as I'm able to see. Uh, see if there's something if there isn't like a very good kite uh only repository i, I might just make them so we'll see it. do you happen to have any um buggy code to show it show how it runs at all as uh, an example not in like a live live demo you can install it on metabot.com it is free uh, so feel free to try it out if you. So any of my code different. I can test it on. <laughs> yeah, uh, any of your Python code currently, because uh, again, we we only support Python right now. Uh, we are up to date, so everything should be fine. Uh, when three point ten comes out, we'll also be supporting that. So it's not a big deal. Uh, but those, yeah. That was the other question. As I, you said, Python, you're working on JavaScript in the background. Are y'all going? Are y'all just kind of? go as requests are needed going into C++ or other things like that? Or are you just sticking with this we, right now? We kind of don't want to branch out into too many languages right now. Uh, because again, we do kind of want to focus on improving our overall detection capability. Uh, so for the other languages, uh, basically what our strategy there is uh, we're doing Java right now, mainly because we have previously agreed to do Java. Uh, but then also, uh, we are trying to take in the learnings that we can get from how our model generalizes across different uh, languages and whether or not we can use, uh, what techniques we can use across different languages to see if there's additional detections that we can support or if they are too distinct in terms of how they're architected or what the common problems are that they won't overlap too much. Uh, and depending on what the learnings are there, we, we're, we're trying to optimize our workflow for either additional languages or, or how we're going to be moving forward. So we intend to support Java and then potentially JavaScript down the line. Uh, for other languages like C++, uh, we, we may or may not support it necessarily. Uh, C++ is definitely more likely to be supported than something like Go or Rust, which already have a very robust and very standardized set of how you handle and operate with them. And because of that, we don't offer that much of a huge advantage, uh, at least until we can get a much higher quality uh, level of uh, detections over the very intricate, very repository spanning types of issues, uh, which hopefully we'll have in like a year or two. So that would be a good time to start going there. But, but we don't have like concrete plans for for other languages. I have a suggestion. Um, what if this code could somehow figure out how a certain program works and then transpile it into another language? Because one of the big complaints, right, about um, technical debt is that legit there is COBOL out there that no one can ever touch because the people who wrote it are retired or even dead and it follows none of the proper programming uh, best practices so the side effects of even the slightest change could be catastrophic if put into production and there's no way to test everything um, there's old fortune 77 that still lives out there 
Um, and there are plenty of people who use C++ who would love to switch over to Rust, but everything is in C++. So what would, like, I mean, this is sort of pie-in-the-sky spitballing. Like, it, it seems almost like you could you could switch over that way and rewrite code bases like that to make them easier to work with. Yeah, it would be really cool. Uh, I don't. I mean, there's a there's there's some issues with using AI to do this, mainly because uh, like you can't do a direct translation for obvious reasons because like internally everything stores differently, uh, at least on the step between the uh, the the language itself and the compiler. Uh, but then after you get into machine code, it's, it's basically the same. So uh, the only issue there would be to go through, and if you're going to be using an AI to generate the code, uh, it's going to have some slip. Uh, and that's unfortunately more or less unavoidable. But that would be something that would probably provide quite a bit of value uh, as we move to more, I guess you could say, robust methodologies when it comes to doing development. Uh, moving the legacy code over there. It would also have for maintainability, just overall. But yeah, uh, it's definitely something that's, that's interesting, but probably not the best use case for AI, uh, at least from my understanding, the problem. Oh, what a shame, because, man, there would be so many things you could do. You could make, like, Rust self-hosting. Yeah, uh, you can do a whole lot of cool, cool things, but uh, like maybe in the future, maybe I'm underselling the, the capabilities, or, or maybe I'm just being a bit, uh, bit too cautious. That might always be the case, uh, but it's definitely something that I think there will, will be a very strong need for in the future. All right, well, uh, if there's no other questions, it was wonderful having the time to go on here and gush about uh, AI and our platform in general. Uh, more than happy to come on by any other time. Maybe after I run that kite versus fed up one-on-one -on -one head to head competition, uh, we can stop by again. Uh, I, I, I have a question before you do. Why, why did you pick this name, Metabob? <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, we sort of just, we picked the logo first, and we drew him. And that guy kind of looks like a Bob. And we're a meta programming tool, at least in the future we will be. So it's Meta Bob. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you asked that question, uh, JK. As I mentioned, uh, probably one of the emails I sent to you, I, uh, I really enjoy There's uh, this sci-fi uh, series of uh, books uh, called The Bobbyverse. Uh, I, yeah, really encourage reading that. It's practically it's some uh, developer dies and uploads his, his brain in a computer and he wakes up somewhere in the future and he replicates all, all over the universe. So. <laughs> and every time when I hear Meta Bob, I hear actually the Bobby verse in my head. <laughs> I <ask> that question. <laughs> and it's good. Like, we didn't even have that in mind, but as long as it works out, it's great. So, it's good. Well, it's catchy, and now uh, people will remember the name just yeah. because of the story. Yes. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, right. it was uh, wonderful being here. Being on, uh, I think Masi wanted to talk for a couple of seconds there, but yeah. I wasn't able to. No, no, I'm sorry, guys. I it was I kind of misunderstood a bit the timing for the meetup, but I mean, Avi is a way better developer than myself anyway, so it was better for him to talk um, than me anyway. So, but yeah, thank you so much, guys, for having us. Um, yeah. We'll yeah, really appreciate you. all the feedback, all the suggestions. That's yeah, really thank you, Marcy. Thank you, Avi. Yeah, this was great, actually. I, I totally enjoyed it. Very interesting uh, work there. Yeah, thanks so much. I appreciate it. Thank you, guys. All right. Yeah, no need to applaud. Like, but <laughs> it was cool, though. <laughs> yeah, stay safe, guys, and have a great rest of the day. And if you guys want to connect on LinkedIn, bounce, like, show us your project or anything, um, I can just yeah, find my team. Uh, 
maybe if you can uh, post uh, the link to your uh, website in the chat. So uh, we, we're going to stay over a little bit longer, but uh, yeah, yeah, you can, yeah, you can post the. Uh, I'll uh, I'll do like uh, that's my LinkedIn. Um, that's my email in case anyone wants to connect again for whatever you guys project are doing. Um, we always love to hear what other people are working on as well. And uh, if you want to check the website, I mean, it's pretty straightforward. It's just metalob.com, but uh, I'll also put it on the in the chat. And uh, yeah, that's that. I love your right. cat, Silas. And uh, <laughs> wait, wait, don't go, guys. I'm trying to connect with you on LinkedIn. <laughs> thank you, yeah. thank you. Yeah, Kitty Clan. All right. So, uh, <laughs> All right. Yeah, so so we it All right, when you find it, post it in the chat. Oh, yeah, I, I posted it in the chat. You there is my link. Uh, your, your LinkedIn uh, URL, right? Yeah, that's my LinkedIn URL. Yeah, uh, I know. Cool. I'm saying you can change it. It doesn't have to be so horrible. I know. I know. <laughs> I kind of like it like that, though. I think like, mine's still horrible. <laughs> Wait, I mean, that, don't, no, that's his middle name. Are you making fun of his name? Yeah, <laughs> I guess so. I guess so. Yeah. No. This thing was more about the hexadecimal at the end of it. <laughs> yeah, so uh, Avi and uh, Masi, so we, we are actually, re we recorded uh, this, so uh, uh, we're going to have to ask for your permission to post this on our uh, Meetup website, uh, YouTube channel, if that's okay with you. Of course, yes. Yeah. No problem. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. So I'm going to stop the recording right now, just so you know. <laughs>